the Real News. I'm Dharna Noor. A new World Health Organization report just released at the UN Climate Talks, or COP24, in Poland shows that an estimated 1 million lives could be saved through reductions in air pollution, as recommended by 2015's UN Paris Climate Accord. Each year, exposure to air pollution causes 7 million deaths through elevated risks of conditions like stroke, heart disease, and lung cancer. With the Trump administration rolling back environmental protections at the federal level, many are looking to state races to enact change. One race in particular was Abdel Al-Sayed's run in Michigan's gubernatorial primary. Al-Sayed lost the Democratic primary to Senate Minority Leader Gretchen Whitmer, but not before garnering the endorsement of Bernie Sanders and others. I spoke with Al-Sayed at the Sanders Institute gathering in Vermont this month, where he spoke on a panel about the need to root the climate crisis in community. Al-Sayed hails from Detroit, a city where air pollution has posed public health crises. Here's an excerpt from his talk, and stick around for our interview. And I want you to imagine if you were a small child, a little girl, let's say you're three years old, and your mom or dad just got laid off because GM shut down a plant at the edge of Detroit and Hamtramck, 1,500 jobs lost, which, by the way, had been built over top of a community, a multi-ethnic community called Pole Town, 30 years ago. They actually had to physically lift five women in a paddy wagon so that the bulldozers could start building at that last minute to build that, that plant. Now, in Detroit, the probability of being hospitalized for asthma is threefold the rest of the state. If you have mild persistent asthma, you're likely to miss at least one school day every two weeks. Why don't you think what that is? And it's not because you got to stay home and play video games. It's because you could not breathe that morning and you had to be rushed to a hospital. And the reason why is because Detroit is the epicenter of most of the biggest carbon emitting plants in the entire state of Michigan. A marathon petroleum refinery probably sits within two miles of that three-year-old girl's home. And that petroleum refinery, they're the biggest single emitter of sulfur dioxide in the entire state. The EPA has ruled them to be in what's called non-attainment. So when we talk about the climate change epidemic, let's think about the roots and the roots are in those communities where this climate is released and the consequences are babies who can't go to school because they cannot breathe. And now my interview with Abdul El-Sayed, who is a contender in Michigan's Democratic gubernatorial primary and now chairs the PAC Southpaw, Michigan. So Abdul, the climate crisis is obviously you know, a, a global crisis affecting every part of the globe, um, of course, particularly hitting uh, first and worst those who are already um, you know, uh, marginalized. Talk about why this is also a local issue. Uh, you just came off of uh, a run in Michigan um, from Detroit, raised in Detroit. Talk about why this is a local issue. Yeah, so Detroit is one of the most industrial parts of the United States, right? The middle of the Rust Belt. And I think, uh, you know, you can, you can know the impact of a tree, whether it's a good tree or a bad tree uh, at its roots. And the roots are the most profound in a place like Detroit. I used to be the health commissioner uh, in that city, and we suffer an asthma epidemic that puts um, three times as many kids in hospitals for asthma in Detroit than the rest of the state of Michigan. Um, and we all know about the Flint water crisis and about the lead poisoning epidemic in places like Detroit. These are um, environmental catastrophes uh, that speak to the truth of environmental injustice. And so um, in understanding how climate change affects people, um, we have to look to the, to the places where the causes of climate change are the worst and then almost always recognize that the impact is always going to be felt by those um, who uh, are the, the most impoverished, poor and working people, and people of color um, who are most marginalized in a society. And the truth of Detroit, I think, speaks to that in profound and, and really troubling ways, in ways that we have to deal with. So talk about what your response is, uh, though, when people um, you know, invoke the, the need to preserve the fossil fuel economy because of the number of jobs um, that it's created. So I went to battle with um, a local marathon petroleum refinery in southwest Detroit. They were the single biggest uh, producer of sulfur dioxide in uh, one of the most polluted zip codes in the entire country, the most polluted in the entire state of Michigan. And they wanted to raise their emissions of sulfur dioxide despite being in what's called non-attainment, meaning the EPA had already said there's too much sulfur dioxide in the air, you cannot put more in. And um, when they wanted to raise their emissions, we realized that they were going to get away with it. The state of Michigan was going to give them a permit. And so we stood up and we said, enough is enough. Uh, these kids are suffering the consequences of what you're doing. And we were able to force them to reduce their emissions, investing $10 million overall to do it. A lot of folks think that these folks can't be beat. 
fact is, if you can organize um, around the people and with people together to build a movement um, to speak truth to these folks and to make them feel the political consequences of their choices, they can be. But beyond that, right, we, we know that the future is not going to be fossil. These are, um, I hate to say it, fossilized uh, corporations that, um, that continue to move down this path because they're trying to protect uh, or, or, or juice out whatever value they see left um, in what is an outdated and technologically irrelevant way uh, of creating energy. So we have to embrace our future. We have to create the political circumstances within which these people recognize the costs of what they do. Um, and we have to start agitating and organizing and centering the conversation around the people who are the most likely to be victims uh, of what they do, both, both in those local communities and generally. Because every time uh, we have a biggest storm in history, right, who are the people who get hurt the most? Um, they're almost always uh, poor and working people, and they're almost always the folks who are most marginalized in their communities. But how, how do we mobilize against, how, how does one mobilize against something uh, that's as moneyed as the fossil fuel industry? I mean, even if, uh, you know, the left and uh, environmentalists have, um, you know, an organizing base, there's never going to be as much capital uh, in those circles as there is in, you know, if you're a Shell or an Exxon. I think what the, the new progressive movement is starting to show is that the only value of money is that it's used to sway public opinion. And if you can short circuit that process, you speak right to people on the truths that they understand explicitly and implicitly you can win. Um, you know, the beauty of the Bernie campaign, the beauty of um, Ocasio-Cortez's campaign, the beauty of so many of the 2018 races, and I hope the future of progressive politics, is that we've done this by being able to take the case directly to people about why we believe what we believe and the sense in it. The, the, the beauty of um, the freedom of speech is that you get to use it, and people get to make their own decisions. Now, they always beat us because they dominate the airwaves. It turns out that a lot of folks just don't watch as much TV anymore. Um, and so they're going to they're gonna start catching up soon, but um, truth is truth, and if you have a good message, um, it is far more compelling. I always uh, joke that you know you can you can sweeten your tea with uh, with white table sugar, or you can use wildflower honey. It takes a lot less of the honey, um, and you get you get a far better result. And um, I think our message is, is wildflower honey. We just have to invest in it, and we have to believe in it. And we got to stop apologizing for it. What do you think the future is of uh, sort of climate justice organizing and climate justice movements at local levels? Um, I think that there's been so much more focus on what can be done at the city level, the state level, because of, uh, you know, the, the climate denial we've seen at the federal level under uh, Trump. Yeah, I think um, I think that's where it starts. Right. Um, there are people in, in, in local communities who are frustrated about the stuff coming out of the smokestack. Right. Frustrated about the fact that they live in the in the shed of a, of a bridge where uh, trucks are idling. Those are the folks who I think are the building blocks of this movement. And if we can center them and we can tell their stories um, of, of organizing and of people power and of taking on these big moneyed interests and winning, when we, when we center their stories, that's what I think coalesces into the kind of state level, national level movement that will ultimately win the future when it comes to this issue. And so um, I actually think they are the future and I think they are the focus and I think um, bringing up their stories matters. One of the challenges I think we as progressives have is that we think that data moves people or, or even, um, even abstract ideals move people. Stories move people. Our, our brains were hardwired over a long period of time to hear stories, right? When uh, you can imagine, um, go back 50,000 years, and uh, you can talk about why a mother tells her kid not to go to the river. She doesn't say, well, you know, 15 out of every 100 children who go to the river uh, are liable to drown, right? She just says, let me tell you about the other boy who went to the river. And we've got to start harnessing the power of stories um, and the power of narrative. And if, if we can do that, I think that's where uh, we win the future. How limited uh, is uh, local organizing and, and local movements, though, by, uh, you know, by the Trump administration, by, uh, you know, the uh, majority Republican, Republican Senate, by even Democrats who are continuing to take fossil fuel contributions? Yeah. Well, look, we've got a long way to go. And, um, you know, you've named all of the opposition. And they're going to keep opposing because that's what's in their focus. I, I prefer not to center them. You know, Trump administration is going to keep doing what it does. But so long as we keep pointing at him and saying, well, everything's impossible, then, you know, that's what that's what I think kills the impetus. And so for me, it's not about them. It's not about what they're going to do. They are what they are. Um, it's like saying, you know, I'm going to climb a mountain and I just wish it was a little bit flatter. Well, the, the mountain's the mountain. Um, and we've got to keep putting one step ahead of the other, centering our message, centering our story, centering our conversation, um, and not ceding space in the conversation to those folks who, you know, because they're bought off or because uh, they've been there all along, um, 
don't see the truth of uh, the injustice that they create. Do you ever find that it's hard to tell those stories, though, when so many people are focusing on what's uh, the more immediate issues that are facing them? I mean, obviously, we know that climate change is currently impacting, uh, you know, especially the global south, uh, poor people, people of color across the globe. But it's often so much easier to see, um, you know, the, the economic troubles that you're facing. Uh, it's so much easier to see your lack of health care or your lack of employment. Well, I'll tell you, um, right now, people are increasingly focused on the environment because at the local level, it affects their lives. And, um, and that's also why I think centering local stories is so important. Um, you know, you can show somebody an image of an iceberg or an image of a sickly polar bear. People don't see icebergs every day. They don't see sickly polar bears or even healthy polar bears. Um, those don't speak as true as telling them about a boy from their community who has to spend a day every other week in a hospital because he's coughing out his lungs. That could be your kid. Right, you know that kid, you've seen that kid walking up and down your street. And <clears throat> that's why I think the local stories are so important because they get us past these abstract ideas that most people can't connect with and they get us to the people who live real lives in their communities. And, um, and that's why I think centering those stories is so powerful because it cuts through this abstract, it cuts through these numbers and it, and it shows you um, the world as it is, the world as it could be. We, I mean, it's, I would be, uh, you know, it would be wrong if I didn't mention though, uh, you know, the organizing and the, the campaign that you ran um, were in many ways uh, a win, but ultimately um, you were defeated in the, in the primary. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that opposition, I think we can, we can see is still uh, very strong. Talk yes. about what still, I guess, gives you hope moving forward and what's next for um, these local climate movements and for the, the global movement for, uh, you know, for uh, environmental justice. Yeah. If we think we're not going to have failures along the way, then we don't appreciate what we're up against. And the nature of effort is not that um, you make the effort once and then you win and then you go home. Um, I think a lot of times folks in my generation have been uh, hardwired <clears throat> to, feel, to, to focus on immediate gratification. And this is not going to be an immediate gratification kind of win. This is <clears throat> the work of a generation and there will be uh, failures along the way. But every failure makes the next success more probable. Um, and the only real failure is when you choose not to try again. Um, and I think we as a movement have to be about continuing to empower even when the going gets difficult, even when we have short-term failures along the way. Um, and, and, and that has to be the commitment that we make because, uh, you know, right now, um, there's too much on the line to give up. All right. Abdul al uh, chair of South Paul, Michigan. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.